Patrick Cagle is Executive Director of JobKeeper Alliance, a nonprofit partnership dedicated to the creation and protection of quality jobs. JobKeeper was launched in 2012 and has since established a reputation as an unwavering advocate for pro-job and pro-growth policies. Patrick regularly appears before regulatory agencies and testifies at public hearings on issues related to coal mining, energy, and transportation infrastructure. His organization has successfully protected Alabama's high-paying coal industry jobs by vigorously opposing anti-coal campaigns funded by environmental interest organizations. JobKeeper has helped unite two unlikely allies in the fight against what is called the War on Coal, the United Mine Workers of America and the coal mine operators who are represented by the Alabama Coal Association. Patrick is working closely with these two entities to oppose EPA's proposed carbon emission rules and other threats to our nation and our coal industry. JobKeeper is based out of Montgomery, Alabama and is currently expanding their footprint to other southeastern states, including Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida. So we're delighted to have with us today Mr. Patrick Cagle. Let's give him a hand as he comes in. Thank you. Uh, George Barber uh, asked me to, uh, to apologize that he was unable to make it. He wants everyone to know he's in good health. Uh, he's following doctor's orders to stay close to home while they monitor uh, his health after a small procedure. Um, before I start, I'll say the one thing that everyone in the room wants to hear. I'll be brief so that I don't stand between you and lunch. Uh, I have some, uh, a speech that George put together that he asked uh, for me to share. And then I have some perspectives uh, from JobKeeper Alliance as a third party advocate who's in the field uh, fighting for jobs. Uh, today, coal-fired energy is still the most affordable and reliable form of energy that we have. Uh, the U.S. mines more than 1 billion tons of coal per year. And most people don't realize that we have enough recoverable coal reserves to meet our needs for the next 250 years. This uh, equates, these reserves equate in heat capacity to about 900 billion barrels of oil. When we talk about uh, the U.S. coal reserves, we're generally divided into the eastern and western divisions. The, uh, the Western Division uh, produces around 500 million tons of coal per year, and the Eastern Division produces around 420 million tons per year. The, uh, the state of Alabama has 2.6 billion tons of recoverable coal and is ranked 15th in the nation in terms of coal production. The economic impact of coal in Alabama is tremendous, with statistics showing it to be in excess of $2 billion. The coal industry creates about 16,000 jobs in Alabama, a fourth of which are high paying mining jobs that pay twice as much as the average annual salary in our state. These jobs support families and local economies and they're vital to our state's economy. The value of coal comes from both the economic opportunities it creates in coal producing states like Alabama, like West Virginia, like the Powder River Basin area. Um, and it's also, uh, the value comes from the affordable and reliable electricity it produces. And this slide, uh, this is a good illustration of the value of having coal in the energy mix. As you can see, California and states in the Northeast have little to no coal in their energy portfolio. And as a result, the power bills, their power bills are 33% higher than those in states that use a significant amount of coal. Unfortunately, despite the low cost and high reliability of coal, EPA is pursuing more overreaching regulations in an attempt to significantly decrease, if not eliminate altogether, coal from our country's energy mix. EPA regulations have already played a, a major role in the closing of 300 coal-fired units in 33 states, and more closures are in the works. We don't need to speculate on the effects of EPA's plan to eliminate coal from the energy mix. We can simply look overseas to see the results. As it was mentioned earlier in Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel instituted a $1.4 trillion energy revolution in which the government shut down nuclear power, attempted to shut down coal, and ramped up the use of renewables. 
Average electricity prices paid by companies in Germany have jumped 60% in the past five years of alone. And these costs um, are due largely uh, as a result of subsidies that the government's paying to renewable energy producers. At the same time, uh, the country's energy grid has become significantly less stable. Now, Germany is significantly increasing their coal-fired generation to help stabilize both the grid and energy prices. They're having to reverse course. Another good example from overseas is Japan. After Fukushima, the government shut down the entire nuclear fleet. Since then, Japan has relied almost entirely on imported natural gas. This resulted in energy prices increasing 50% and has created a $200 million trade deficit in the country. Now Japan is preparing to restart their nuclear reactors to, subsidize, to st stabilize their economy. This is a great example of the dangers of putting all your eggs in one energy basket. As you know, EPA's proposed carbon emissions rule for existing power plants threatens to close many more coal-fired units and threatens the very existence of coal-fired generation in our country. This rule will necessarily raise power bills for consumers and will result in the loss of 178,000 jobs per year. You would think with all that economic pain, there'd be at least some environmental gain. However, that's just not the case. This rule will reduce global carbon emissions by less than 1%. What we need is a true all the above energy strategy, not the all the above except coal energy policy that EPA is, is creating. It's important to note that EPA is not acting alone. Environmental interest groups are implementing a well-funded and highly coordinated effort to create the perception of support for EPA's carbon rules. At the recent EPA hearing in Atlanta, one out of every seven people who registered to speak registered on behalf of Sierra Club. In states like Florida, millions of dollars are being spent to influence the November elections by interest groups trying to silence leaders that do not fully embrace their climate agenda. And in Alabama and many of the southern states represented in this room, the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy are using millions of dollars provided by the California-based Energy Foundation to fund their regulatory and legal fights aimed at forcing state regulators to shutter viable coal-fired units rather than allowing utilities to install new pollution controls and keep these assets in service. The takeaway here is that the battle over the future of coal is taking place not just at the federal level, it's taking place at state regulatory agencies and in the court of public perception. While each of us in this room understand the value of coal, we must do more to convey this information to the general public. Every consumer needs to know that these regulations will impact their pocketbook and possibly their livelihood. Uh, there's not many groups like JobKeeper Alliance that go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the environmental uh, advocacy industry. Um, we're outnumbered and we're largely outfunded. But we're effective because we do a couple of things. We go into situations where we know everything we can, can possibly know about our opponents. We know them as well as we know ourselves. We find the weakness in their arguments, and for the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, it's the fact they're trying to dictate Southern energy policy in Southern states using money from the California-based Energy Foundation. Um, and uh, when we go into a situation in a regulatory body in uh, public hearings, and uh, what we do to try to get our message out through social media through, uh, and through the general media to the extent we can, we, we approach the situation like this. We swing first and we don't stop because we can't. Uh, industry cannot afford to ignore the threat that's posed by this environmental advocacy industry. We must do more to defend the affordable and reliable energy that our country depends on and that quality jobs depend on. If EPA's proposed rules go into place, we're going to lose jobs. But it's, the threat doesn't stop there. These environmental interest groups are not going to go away and say that we accomplished our goal. EPA's put in place the, the plan we've been calling for for years. They're going to push for tighter restrictions on coal. They're not going to stop till coal's out of the energy mix, and then they're going to set their sights on natural gas. 
It's a business for these groups, and the issues will never go away, and we must approach, we must approach it as such, and we've got to match their efforts toe-to-toe -to -toe and then do a little more to try to defend the, um, the energy supply that's responsible for the jobs we depend on. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you all allowing me to speak today. Uh, what kind of money is being spent from West Coast interest groups to influence energy policy in the South? And I can tell you that the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy have received well over $3 million in the last few years alone for their work in just the Southern states. Uh, this money comes from foundations. Uh, the, it's just basically the dividends and interest on large, uh, on large foundations that have been set up. It's going to continue to flow. And the goal ultimately is to, is to push renewables and absolutely eliminate coal from the energy mix. And as I said earlier, uh, if they accomplish that goal, they'll set their sights on natural gas. Um, it's just a different ideal. Uh, it's, I think it's not based on reality and it's not based on the needs and understanding of, of what uh, affordable, reliable baseload power means to our country and the industries that create the jobs that we all depend on. We actually do work here in Alabama closely with the AFL-CIO and the IBEW. Um, in Alabama, this is kind of unusual. We're, I think we're probably the model for the rest of the country in how business and labor can come together to fight for their mutual interest in protecting jobs. Uh, nationally, uh, there's some momentum there. Uh, the United Mine Workers have been very active alongside the IBEW in, uh, in opposing EPA's regulations. And I think it's incumbent on business and industry to reach out and embrace that. You know, just because you've had differences and you may still continue to have differences with labor groups in a business setting, those differences are, are minuscule compared to the threats that our industry is facing. If, um, if there's no jobs, uh, those, you know, those small disagreements don't matter. Uh, so I think it's important for industry to reach out and embrace that partnership more. Um, it takes setting aside a lot of history. You know, a lot of companies may have had a contentious and may continue to have a contentious relationship uh, with their union employees. But on these issues, we've, you know, uh, set a model of how you can successfully work side by side to fight for jobs. In almost every other state, Sierra Club's leading the charge. In Alabama, the Southern Environmental Law Center, which is one of their partners, is taking the, the lead publicly. I mean, they, each of these work groups work very closely on everything they do. They may choose to let one take the lead publicly, but they're, you know, they're active together. But you're right, in most states, Sierra Club is leading the charge. A lot of their money comes from the same energy foundation. Um, I encourage everyone to go to their website, it's ef.org, look at the database and see who's being funded in your state to fight coal. Uh, Sierra Club's got a, an even larger base of, uh, of funders uh, and they are the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla that, that most are dealing with. And you mentioned the boiler makers and the pipe fitters. They were actually part of the rally in Pittsburgh against the EPA regulations. It was the coal miners, IBEW, pipe fitters and boiler makers and those are great partners because the IBEW represents the majority of the folks that work in the uh, coal generation plants around the country. And the pipe fitters and boiler makers also help keep those plants running. So their jobs are directly on the line and they see the, Im the imminent threat. Uh, so they're an easy partner to engage. So Patrick, what, uh, what is JobKeeper doing in those communities where we've found that uh, there are great job losses. Uh, what, what recommendations are you wake, uh, making? What initiatives are you guys starting that will, uh, that will help those communities recover? Uh, we're a small organization. Our focus is on defending jobs before they're lost. Uh, I mean, we, we fight, uh, we go toe to toe with groups that are actively fighting, you know, new coal terminals, uh, new coal mines, fighting to close coal fired power plants. Uh, and that's our focus, is protecting jobs before they're lost. 